child is left in a car on a hot summer day while the parent runs an errand. The temperature inside the car quickly exceeds 100 degrees. When the parent returns to the car, their worst nightmare becomes reality. One child dying this horrible way is unacceptable. Yet every year in the United States, about 36 infants die in hot cars. You see this and are outraged because the problem is prevalent. What do you do? Do you demand justice? Do you share the story on social media feeling validated with every like the post receives? If so, how did those actions truly solve the problem? While it perhaps made you feel better, your actions did nothing to prevent this from happening again. After hearing several stories about this issue, I knew there was a problem, so I took it upon myself to truly solve it. My name is Madison Lucy, and I'm a 16-year-old high school student. I demonstrate by action that if I can find a solution to a problem, then anyone can. When I was 15 years old, I joined my school's computer club where I improved my computer skills with my classmates. Around that time, there were several horrific stories on the news just like this about children dying in hot cars. And I learned that happens every summer. I knew this was a problem that could be fixed with technology, and I wondered why no one had done it. No infant or child should ever be left alone in a car, even for a moment. And before you think that only an irresponsible parent would leave their child alone in a hot car, it could happen to anyone. Consider a scenario where you pull up to a coffee shop and your baby is sleeping in their car seat. You don't want to wake them up, so you just go in for 30 seconds to grab a coffee. In that time, you have an unexpected medical emergency, such as a diabetic shock, epileptic seizure, or even a heart attack. It could be any condition like that. You're a well-meaning person who left their child in a car on a hot summer day. This should not happen, but it actually does. To fix this problem, I made a smart car seat. I used a Raspberry Pi 3 computer and developed a system that used two sensors. A weight sensor to tell if a child is in their car seat and a temperature sensor to sense if the temperature is either too hot or too cold. If a child is left in a hot car, then an emergency text alert would be sent out immediately to the caregivers and first responders so that action could be taken. I demonstrated my invention on the news to show just how easily it worked. I then put the code open source on GitHub so that other creators could use it and expand on it. I'm often asked why I didn't patent the car seat invention and sell it. The reason why is because my goal was to raise awareness, not to make money. If a person has a gift or talent, I believe they should use that gift to help others. And that's what I decided to do. I truly solved a problem. After the car seat issue, I started an online petition requesting additional legislation to improve child safety standards. This is when I first considered politics. I then saw an issue with the smart meters that the electric companies use. Analog and smart meters measure the amount of electricity used in a residential or commercial building and provide data on the amount of electricity used. Sounds great, right? However, there have been numerous complaints about the accuracy of smart meter readings. Many smart meter consumers have reported increasingly high electric bills and have expressed concern about whether the smart meter's use of radio waves is safe or can lead to health issues. Out of 41 states which considered the issues with smart meter opt-outs, Pennsylvania is the only state which did not provide a choice for its residents. In Pennsylvania, 
we don't have a choice between if we want an analog meter or a smart meter. If you'd rather stay with an analog meter but are forced into having a smart meter, what would you do to solve the problem? Would you complain to the electric company? Would you yell at the representative on the phone when they tell you there's nothing they can do about it? <laughs> Would you organize a protest march? I feel that people should have a choice regarding which meter they have. In my school's youth and government club, my assignment was to write a bill. So I chose to write a bill that would allow Pennsylvania residents to choose which meter they want. After I completed it for my school assignment, I decided to make it real. I did extensive legal research and developed a website, client and server side, to show every other state's legislation on this matter. My website included a petition outline where each person could customize it and fill in their own contact information, including their name, address, and email. This was a significant step up from my first petition for the car seat. I made the system so that when the user emailed their customized petition from my website, it then went to every Pennsylvania representative and senator after an influx of petitions from residents across the state, my bill picked up momentum. I also had Pennsylvania residents mail me copies of their petitions with their signatures and contact information so that I could bring that with me to meetings with the legislators. This was the impetus that got me noticed and listened to by the legislators. I then took the bill that I'd written to Senator Mike Fulmer, and he actually listened. <laughs> he reviewed it and thoroughly discussed it with me. He said that he would support my bill, and after several more meetings, we got some more legislators on board. Senator Mario Scavello and Senator Kitty Muth joined as prime sponsors to present my bill with bipartisan support. We decided the best way to present my bill to have it gain co-sponsors and get passed quickly as Pennsylvania state law. While it hasn't officially passed as a bill yet, it is well on its way. I truly solved a problem. But wait, that's not all. Around the same time that I started my bill, my school invited me to see their new building, which was still under renovations. The director showed me blueprints of what it was going to be. It was to become AgWorks, the largest educational aquaponics laboratory in the entire country. Aquaponics is the marriage and bond between fish and plants. That's because the fish produce waste, and that is then food for the plants but also the plants will clean the water that can then be used back for the fish again. Because of this, aquaponics uses 93% less water than traditional agriculture. And that's a huge difference because the water can just be recycled back again. Simply said, it produces more food with fewer resources. At that time, I wasn't really interested in agriculture or aquaponics. However, as I saw the growth of this laboratory coming together, I became more and more interested in it. I started to envision the possibilities. I volunteered to contribute and began working in the lab. I learned that the largest cost to an aquaponics operation is manpower. I then recruited two classmates, and in six months, we created an automated plant seeder that utilizes artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to be self-sustainable, solar-powered, and mobile, all in a controlled environment. It increases productivity without increasing manpower costs, thus solving the problem. So, while I may not seem like the typical teenager, I am. I also like to play video games. One day I was playing Minecraft, which is a video game where players from anywhere in the world can play against each other through an online platform. 
I was bothered by some of the hateful comments some players are making to others. I noticed that players who were different or had special needs, such as autism, were not being treated nicely. It was becoming quite a problem. So I decided to solve it. In 2013, I developed a Minecraft server called Catscraft. It's a safe zone for kids. I included filters so that no player could curse at another. This server has been running for over six years. So if you do the math, I solved this problem when I was 10 years old. And I'm not really tall to begin with, so when I was 10, I was right about here. <laughs> I feel that if a person sees a problem and they have the capability of enacting positive change, then they have an obligation to do something. We have access to vast amounts of information on almost any topic, easily accessible, right at our fingertips. And with that, we should stop waiting for others to provide solutions. We should stop waiting to be told what to do and instead rise above and take charge of our own lives. This involves using whatever skills or tools a person has to accomplish the goal. Everyone has more skills than they realize, but those skills are too often left dormant. Sometimes people don't take action because they think someone else will. This is called the bystander effect, and unfortunately, it results in no one taking any action. Therefore, sometimes it may be safer to assume that no one else is going to do anything, but it's imperative that you do. I would rather risk embarrassing myself jumping up to help when it's not necessary than miss being there when needed. Ask yourself if you've ever avoided facing a problem and then been unhappy with the outcome. If so, then next time, don't avoid the problem. Instead, embrace it, because any problem can be solved when a person breaks that problem down into manageable-sized pieces and follows through with making positive change. Accomplishing something good does take work and effort, but it's worth it. Lastly, when there's a problem, solve it for the right reason. Do it because it is the right thing to do. When something is done from the kindness of a person's heart with a genuine attempt to make things better, then surely the result will be something beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.